London in the 1700s was surrounded by thieves. The roads leading to and from London were littered with men on horses who would rob from the rich and keep it for themselves. The profession was seen as romantic and heroic, but in reality it was dangerous, dark and deadly. This time on Macabre London, we'll be uncovering the tale of London's highwaymen. London today is a bustling metropolis, an exciting place to visit, and a somewhat safe place to call home. An eclectic mix of people from all over the world live in London. In some parts of this vibrant capital, the crime rate is lower than that of much smaller cities in other parts of the UK. However, things haven't always been so safe. Stories and tales of old have echoed around the streets and grown to become that of legend, particularly those of a gruesome nature. Today we'll be exploring one of these stories and discovering about London's often bloody past. My name is Nikki Drees and this is Macabre London. London hasn't always been the concrete jungle it is today. Back in the 18th century, the capital was littered with heaths, parks and dense woodland. On the city streets, people were subjected to a lawless rule of criminals who could steal from whomever they liked, with little to no consequence unless they got caught by a thief taker. Thief takers were an interim measure before the official police force was founded, but many were corrupt or controlled by the government meaning most people didn't feel the benefit of their presence and were still terrorised by petty thieves. For many who survived on stealing, the safest way to commit their crime was to join a gang. Some gangs of robbers had upwards of 30 members and often the stolen goods would be distributed somewhat evenly amongst the group, making it fair and meaning group members were more likely to stay. However, sometimes they broke away and formed smaller groups to get a larger chunk of the loot. But with fewer numbers came more risk of getting caught. Footpads, who were highwaymen without horses, would often rob people under the cover of darkness, but tried to stay away from acts of violence alongside their thievery. Violent robberies were punishable by death, and so by taking items without using grievous bodily harm, the thief would only be subjected to a small amount of torture which would allow your fellow thieves to see you publicly humiliated in the hope that they may learn a lesson. For those who were slightly better off than footpads, the addition of a horse made robbing travellers a much easier pursuit. Only the really wealthy could afford horse-drawn carriages, and with London only having a few decent roads to speak of, highwaymen could easily lie in wait, knowing that at some point a rich procession would cross their path. For the reputation that was earned for being polite to those they robbed, the highwaymen of England were seen as gallant gentlemen and their profession was somewhat romanticised, not just after the event, but even in its day. Highwaymen were often well dressed and would only become violent if the situation really called for it. For example, if those they were robbing decided to put up a fight or not quickly renounce their belongings. However, most robberies were non-violent but some highwaymen had a more vicious reputation than others. Dick Turpin, for example, known for his exploits in Essex, and thus not earning himself a full macabre London episode of his own, was the head of the Essex gang, an extremely malevolent and devious gang who were definitely repulsively violent. In their arsenal of robbery techniques, they would often carry out home invasions, known for breaking and entering into fairly poor homesteads, the gang would subject residents to hideous torture, which included boiling water being poured over the victims, being forced to sit on hot coals, and even rape. The Essex gang were not worthy of their subsequent romanticising, and for many at the time were a major source of fear and sleeplessness, 
thus making Dick Turpin a name that became unfairly gentrified. Two of the most notorious highwaymen were far less violent than the Essex gang, and luckily for me, lived in London, so those are the two you'll be hearing about today. James McLean was an Irish-born son of a Glaswegian minister, brought up in a religious household in County Monaghan, in the province of Ulster in Ireland. It was expected that James would fall in the same footsteps as his brother, who had also become a minister, taking after his dad. James had a relatively educated upbringing and considered a few career paths, none of which he ever embarked upon. With grand ideas to become a successful and wealthy trading merchant, James stumbled at the first hurdle when he realised that he wasn't too sure in what to trade and equally didn't have enough money to begin his purchasing of tradable commodities. Luckily for James, he didn't have to wait long to stumble into money as his father passed away unexpectedly and at the tender age of 18, he found himself cashing in his inheritance money. With his new small fortune burning a hole in his pocket, it wasn't long before James had spent the lot on drink, gambling, women, and the latest finery. With his pocket money used up and in search of cleaning up his act, James packed his bags and left Ireland to start a new life in London. Not long after James had set foot in the city, he soon found himself enchanted by a young lady who happened to be the daughter of a horse dealer. Another attractive thing about her was that she had a dowry over her head, which made her a good prospect for the penniless James. The two married quickly, and even though he may have possibly married her for money, he was reported to have been madly in love with her. As part of the marriage, James received a dowry of 500 pounds, which he spent sensibly on setting up a business as a grocer, selling fruits and vegetables in Cavendish Square. The two were not extravagantly rich, but they were comfortable and the business was profitable. James's wife was also able to have a purpose of her own as she played a big hand in the business, meaning she was instrumental in the relationship and not just a kept woman. This must have been quite liberating for her at a time when women weren't often offered job opportunities or any definitive roles, apart from being a caregiver to those in their family. It wasn't long before children arrived and James's wife gave birth to a daughter. But not long after, James's wife, who contracted a mystery illness, deteriorated quickly and sadly passed away, leaving her infant daughter behind. During his wife's illness, James had left their business to subside in order to care for her and began gambling to obtain easy money, which didn't require him to work long hours. This meant that the business that was once thriving was equally dying and his income was quickly dwindling. James also handed over his daughter to her grandparents as society wouldn't have allowed him to be a single parent as it just wasn't something a young man would have been expected to do back then. After just three short years of marriage, James had lost everything and he was left alone, bereft and penniless. During his wife's illness, James had been introduced to an apothecary by the name of William Plunkett. William Plunkett was equally as broke as McLean, and it didn't take much persuasion for the pair to head off on a jaunt to Somerset on the hunt for a rumoured impressive dowry. Plunkett had heard that there was £10,000 up for grabs from a wealthy heiress, and the two formulated a plan to act as high society gentlemen in order to obtain it. Plunkett took the role of James's footman, and James played the part of the wealthy merchant. The pair did well and were almost able to secure the marriage, but due to a fight breaking out in a local pub and the two men getting involved, they were recognised as brutes, their cover was blown and they retreated back to London with their tails firmly between their legs. A few months passed and Maclean decided he would leave London in search of sunnier climes. He saved up enough money to board a clipper to Jamaica, but the night before he was meant to go, he went out drinking and gambling and lost his fare, meaning his plans to flee the city were scuppered once again. Plunkett was equally still broke, and he convinced McLean that the rich were adequately provisioned to share some of their wealth to line both of their pockets. For Plunkett, he saw cash cows lazily parading their wares through London's highways and byways, and they were ripe for the picking. Unlike other thieves who were indiscriminate about who they robbed, Plunkett and McLean would only steal from those that could afford it. The first robbery the pair tried to carry out 
didn't quite go as planned. They stopped a coach, but McLean lost his nerve and rode away on his horse, leaving Plunkett alone and outnumbered, but he still managed to wrestle 30 guineas from the man for his troubles. However, hold-up number two was more successful, and so began a spree of over 20 robberies. The loot which was hauled from the many stagecoaches and travellers consisted of mainly money, watches and fancy clothes, but on one occasion an enormous bag of diving gear, including an incredibly heavy diving suit with a copper helmet, was wrestled from the rear of a coach, something which must have been quite hard to quickly get away with. By this time, Plunkett and McLean had honed their robberies and more importantly worked on their branding. They both now had elegant and fast horses, wore only the best finery, some of which was no doubt robbed from the backs of the passing nobility, and they had a regular patch they roamed in Hyde Park, but perhaps their most recognisable element was their masks. The Venetians had been wearing masks for many centuries before the trend of them cropped up in 18th century London. The masks were used in order to cover the wearer's identity, and thus their social status, which meant the wearer was able to party at will, with no recourse for their debauched behaviour being recounted to those that knew them. Plunkett and Maclean used the masks in much the same way. By dressing in such a fanciful style, they levelled themselves with their victims, and thus, by being charming and well-dressed, would find it easier to extract what they wanted, as they were not seen to be the brutes that other robbers were renowned for. If the victim was to comply quickly and easily, it would make everything much less traumatising for all involved. As James's reputation grew, so did his propensity towards acting the part, and as such his victims began calling him the Gentleman Highwayman. That's not to say that Maclean and Plunkett were pushovers. They would also use pistols should they see fit, but never shot at anyone in order to hurt them, only to hurry them up when they didn't comply fast enough. Most victims figured that it wasn't worth calling the pair's bluff, and the pistols worked as an effective threat and for extrapolating cash and belongings quickly. With their pockets lined and living the life of relative luxury, the pair seemed to be unstoppable. One night, when lurking in Hyde Park, as they usually did, the pair couldn't believe their luck when they saw an incredibly fancy carriage riding towards them. They waved the cab down and brandished their pistols before ordering the person inside to hand over their loot. The traveller happened to be Horace Walpole, a minor celebrity of the day, who would do wonders for the pair's reputation. Walpole was a writer who couldn't believe his luck, as he knew he would be able to tell his story afterwards to numerous sources. From Walpole, James and William stole a relatively decent haul, but as they were doing so, James's pistol accidentally went off next to Horace's face, which was not at all what was intended. A few days passed, and Horace was mildly scuffed from the ordeal, but was otherwise unharmed. A note was delivered to Walpole as an apology, but equally as a ransom note for his belongings. James had written to let Horace know that he had not meant to frighten him during the robbery, and that he was deeply sorry for any upset he had caused as a result of the accidental gunshot. He then went on to ask Walpole to bring more money in exchange for his belongings, Walpole decided it was best off negotiating with Maclean and Plunkett via a third party as well, and eventually the goods were returned for a fee, which would have been the same they would have earned from their resale. Perhaps, as Maclean had nearly shot Walpole, he may have decided that it was the least he could do to make up for this. Walpole did as he was expected, and began to tell his story around London. As such, Plunkett and Maclean's notoriety was blossoming. People were beginning to sell ballads about the pair, and as such, word spread even further. A ballad seller would pen a song about the current events of the week, and then sell the performance and a printed or written version to the buyer for them to recount to others should they wish. As such, this meant that the story of Plunkett and Maclean spread far and wide. Maclean's infamy was having a knock-on effect on the crime rate in London. Burglary rates were up, footpads were on the rise, and highwaymen were becoming an infestation in any leafy area with a main carriage route. Unfortunately for James, he was about to become a victim of his own success. After a robbery where the list of items stolen was shared with locals, it was only a matter of time before James would have been caught. 
As the one to do all of the selling and the pairing, McLean knew he had to be careful with what he sold. In order to avoid detection, he removed the lace from a stolen waistcoat and sold the two pieces separately. The lace happened to be handed over to a broker who needed to have it valued before offering James the money for it, a relatively common practice which didn't raise any suspicion with him. However, the person who had originally sold the lace was the one whom the broker took it to, which instantly landed James in trouble. He was arrested and his house searched. Inside, the officers found watches, purses, expensive clothing, and the blunderbuss of one of his victims, which had been missing since the robbery. This confirmed that McLean was the infamous gentleman highwayman, and the jig was up. James was sent to the notoriously horrid Newgate Jail whilst awaiting his trial. Whilst in prison, and during his trial, he received over 3,000 visitors, many of whom were women who wanted to see the dashing highwayman in the flesh. Even though his case was a cause celebre, which may have made it less likely for James to be convicted, things didn't look to be falling in his favour. With Plunkett keeping a low profile elsewhere and James not snitching on his friend, it was looking more and more certain that he would face the way of most major criminals of his day, even with his gift of the gab. In a last ditch attempt to save James from the gallows, his ministerial brother travelled from his residence in Holland to plead with the court, but as his case was so high profile, the judge had no other option than to send James to the gallows. If the justice system was to be fair, it had to be fair for everyone. Despite having not murdered anyone, caused any undue upset, and only taking from the rich, McLean was the anti-hero of the lower classes, and even high society were charmed by his gentlemanly manner. However, this was all in vain, as McLean was sentenced to death. On the 3rd of October 1750, McLean was taken to Tyburn, and met the same fate as many others before him upon the gallows in front of the public. He was just 26 years old. McLean was made an example of. If it wasn't for the copycats and his popularity, James would have been allowed to go free, but due to his notoriety, he had created a rod for his own back. Walpole clearly felt he had somewhat of a part to play in McLean's demise, as he often referred to him in letters and said that he felt sorry for what had become of him. In one letter, he said his robbery by McLean had latterly had no effect on the outcome of James being sent to the gallows, but that he did consider him to now be a friend, even though McLean had robbed him, then blackmailed him, and the two had never met again since the night of the robbery. Walpole said he'd considered visiting James in prison, but found it to be too sorry a state for him to attend, as it upset him too much. As for Plunkett, he escaped without consequence and was allowed to keep his ill-gotten gains. There are some reports that Plunkett made a new life for himself and became a colonel of a militia in America, but when the timelines are shown next to each other, the dates don't quite add up, as he would have had to have been in his late fifties when carrying out the murders, and as McLean and Plunkett were said to be of a similar age, this suggests that it wasn't the same William Plunkett. As a result of McLean's public execution, which served as a warning to others, thinking of continuing the highwayman profession, there was a significant drop in the number of robberies. The improvement of the police force continued, with patrols almost entirely dedicated to stopping robberies. The improvement of the police force continued, with patrols almost entirely dedicated to stopping robberies. The invention of banknotes, and equally the Enclosure Act of 1773, which saw a vast majority of previously free land become boundaried. This meant that highwaymen were now forced to escape along defined roads, which would make the risk of capture much higher. Highway robbery rapidly declined and soon became obsolete. The last highway robbery made on horseback in the UK was in the early 19th century, and the last of the highwaymen had moved on, and the profession died a death. James McLean's legacy lived on for a while after his death, and he was even chronicled in the popular artist of the time, William Hogarth's Four Stages of Cruelty, as his skeleton is shown in an alcove, looking over another executed criminal whose body is equally about to be offered the same fate of broiling, skinning, and exhibiting to the public as a novelty. 
For Plunkett and McLean, their legacy has lived on throughout the centuries. In the 80s, their notable style inspired Adam and the Ants Stand and Deliver, and even into the 1990s, when there was a dramatised film celebrating the pair's lovable roguish behaviour by the name of Plunkett and McLean, continuing to spread the word of the distinguished gentleman highwayman. For most, the image of a highway robber is the typical gentleman highwayman, and for this we have to thank James McLean for crafting the iconic look. He came from something, stole from those who could afford it, but literally ended up with absolutely nothing and a noose around his neck, serving as a warning for others that may choose a life of crime, ultimately making him the most iconic highwayman and someone who should be remembered for many more centuries to come. Thank you for joining me for yet another episode of Macabre London. It's nice to be back, nice to see you again. Let me know what you thought of James McLean in the comments down below. Do you think it's fair that William Plunkett got off scot-free? I'm not sure that I do, but I'd love to hear what you think. So let me know, drop me a comment. If you'd like to see more episodes like this, then please subscribe, hit that red button below. And don't forget to tell people about the show as well. I love it when people's friends pop over here, so um, please continue to do that. Don't forget to check out my Patreon where you can help to support making these episodes in return for some goodies and also other exclusive video content which isn't shown anywhere else. Patreon's starting to grow and if you're already one of my patrons it means the absolute world. T-shirts are now available to buy from the link in the show notes and description so do please check them out as they're limited and close to selling out. Thank you for joining me for another macabre tale from London's past. I've been Nikki Druce and I'll see you next time.